Good morning, one and all. Thank you very much for being here. Um, in the uh, presence of several people who I admire greatly and who have taught me a lot about the, the subject of Iran and the threat that it represents, including my friend Michael Ledeen, from whom you'll be hearing later, uh, Jeff, others here. It's a privilege, therefore, to have a chance to speak to you before they do, so that uh, hopefully I can get a few ideas on the table that um, they will be further uh, informing and, and uh, I'm sure, uh, greatly in illuminating. Um, this is an incredibly timely moment to be talking about this subject um, because, frankly, our eye is off the ball. We are witnessing upheavals throughout the Middle East and North Africa uh, and, for that matter, elsewhere in the world that are driving attention uh, limited under the best of circumstances here in Washington and resources away from what I consider to be the preeminent national security threat of the moment, which is the Islamic Republic of Iran and its ambitions to exercise hegemony not only in the Middle East, but to extend its agenda far more broadly at the expense of everything that we here in the free world hold dear. And uh, I want to spend a minute just talking about what that agenda is about. Because I think if you don't understand what these guys are motivated by, what animates them, it's hard to get your head around what we really are up against. And I think it's best defined by a term that the enemy uses to describe their agenda. Mm -hmm. They call it Sharia. And I was privileged to help pull together a terrific group of national security professionals, including uh, former Director of Central Intelligence Jim Woolsey, former DIA Director of Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Director uh, Lieutenant General Ed Soyster, uh, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, Andy McCarthy, <coughs> and former Federal Prosecutor, a number of others, to publish this book entitled Sharia, the Threat to America. And I really commend it to all of you. It is a kind of one-stop shopping on the doctrine that, as I say, informs not only what Iran is up to, but a great many others who may disagree on certain points of the practice of Islam, but are nonetheless of absolutely one mind with respect to their obligations under Sharia, namely to establish it globally as the political, military, legal program of Muslims and non-Muslims alike, and to have a caliph rule according to it worldwide, or an imam, if you will, under the Shia tradition. This doctrine compels its adherence to pursue jihad in order to achieve those two goals. And jihad can take several different forms, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it in the course of the day, how they are being pursued by Iran. The violent kind, with which we've, of course, become most familiar since 9-11, and the stealthy kind, with which, by and large, at least we here in the United States, are still largely unaware. And again, this is, I think, one of the most important contributions of this, uh, what we call Team B2 report, is that it really puts a very sharp focus on the role that the stealth or what the Muslim Brotherhood calls civilization jihad, plays in undermining Western societies and setting them up for violent coup de grace, the, uh, the ultimate triumph of this Sharia program. One of the things that, as one looks at this agenda, this program of Sharia, is unmistakable, though it flies in the face of a lot of conventional wisdom, or what passes for wisdom, particularly here in, uh, in official Washington. 
is that the Sunnis and the Shia are perfectly capable of collaborating despite their differences, and again, some points of, of Islamic practice, in order to achieve their shared goals. We see a lot of this, and again, I'm sure that will be amplified by um, folks like my colleague Claire Lopez, who's just joined us, one of the uh, Team B co-authors, by the very direct relationship between Iran and Hamas, for example, or for that matter, between Iran and Al-Qaeda, or between Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood, something that is becoming more and more manifest by the day as this so-called Arab awakening is proving, I think, to be, if not engineered by, certainly to be the uh, opportunity for the Muslim Brotherhood and its friends to seize power in nation after nation after nation in the Middle East and North Africa, and perhaps again beyond. One example of this, uh, relationship, the budding relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and Iran um, was the visit by a senior Muslim brother to Iran, in which he was very well received, needless to say, and from which he took away the uh, desire to have a Khomeini-style regime installed in Egypt. Similarly, we've seen the Iranian leadership uh, extolling the Muslim Brotherhood. So again, this idea that somehow we will be able to be protected against the threat posed by Iran by help from the Sunni world is not by any means uh, a given, I believe. Um, one of the other problems that is particularly worrying in the context of the Shia Islamic tradition now practiced by the regime in Tehran is this phenomenon of the Twelvers, the belief that what they will ultimately engineer is the return of the Twelfth Imam, the Mahdi, who will usher in the Golden Age of Islam. Uh, this, unfortunately, under their tradition, requires a kind of turmoil, disorder, mayhem, that um, for most people's purposes looks an awful lot like the apocalypse. And the extent to which people who have that as their ambition, and the conviction that it is indeed to them to bring this about, that they're acquiring the means by which perhaps to generate apocalyptic kind of circumstances has got to be of tremendous concern to all of us who uh, aren't quite ready for the end of days. Apocalypse now is literally no exaggeration, particularly when we hear repeatedly from senior Iranian officials, including notably, but not exclusively, the President, Mohammad Ahmadinejad, that they not only have in mind wiping Israel off the map, but they believe that a world without America is not simply desirable, but achievable. Now, I've spent a fair amount of time wondering how a country with the relatively limited capabilities of an Iran could conceivably think that it could bring about a world without America. And I keep being driven to basically one very worrying scenario. And that is, unfortunately, one that they seem increasingly manifestly pursuing, at least the capabilities to affect it. What is that scenario? The scenario has been described by a Blue Ribbon Commission and paneled by the United States Congress. It's actually provided several different reports. Peter Husey, among others, is, is very familiar with uh, 
this commission's work. It assessed the threat of something known as a strategic electromagnetic pulse attack, or EMP strike, that would be precipitated by putting into space over the United States by a ballistic missile a nuclear weapon and detonating it exoatmospheric. The effect of which we know from exoatmospheric tests of nuclear devices back in the earlier days of the Cold War generates an immense amount of electromagnetic energy, which will cascade down onto electronic and electrical devices within line of sight of that burst. So the higher the altitude at which the detonation takes place, the more territory on the ground is affected. With something that has, by some estimates, been calculated to approximate a million times the power of the most powerful radio signal on Earth. If electronic and electrical devices are not shielded against that kind of intense burst of energy, there are actually three different bursts that uh, waves that will affect these devices, but if they're not shielded against them, according to this Blue Ribbon Commission, many, if not most, perhaps virtually all, of those within that line of sight will be damaged, if not irreparably destroyed. Now, to the extent that that could include the components of the electrical grid of the United States, or significant parts thereof, the effect would be, in the words of this commission, catastrophic. For a sense of how this would work, think about Katrina. In the aftermath of which the cascading effects of the loss of electrical power on every aspect of the infrastructure, from telecommunications and finance to water and sewage to transportation to food distribution to medical services, are essentially put out of business. And the problem is that with an attack like this, the effect is not something that is basically remedied by simply rebooting or bringing to bear the resources of the rest of the nation, because the rest of the nation may be in very difficult straits as well. By the estimates of Dr. William Graham, who was the chairman of this Blue Ribbon Commission for the Congress, Within one year of such an electromagnetic pulse attack, perhaps as many as nine out of 10 Americans would be dead, simply as a function of not being able to survive in conditions under which there is no electricity and all of the supporting infrastructure which makes life in our civilized 21st century superpower society possible. <coughs> The Iranians have not only been beavering away, as we all know, on nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. They have been demonstrating the capacity to launch missiles off of vessels, enabling missiles of relatively short range to be brought to the target rather than have to have an intercontinental range of particular advantage of that approach is you may not have a signature as to who was responsible for this kind of devastating attack. They've also demonstrated with the Shahab 3 what appears to be a simulated deployment in space of precisely the kind of device that would trigger this sort of electromagnetic pulse attack. They're not the only ones, of course, who know about this vulnerability of ours or are working towards it. Their friends and allies and uh, partners in crime 
North Korea are also assiduously working on these kinds of capabilities with a similar end, I believe, in mind. So, to the extent that we are facing people who believe God is directing them to destroy us, at the very minimum, to force us to submit to their Sharia program, <coughs> To the extent that they are making common cause with others, both within the Muslim world and outside of it, in the means to perhaps affect that kind of uh, forced submission on a wholesale basis, in the interest of bringing about the return under their particular strain of theology of the Messiah. This is a problem. We ignore it at our extreme peril. And I suspect in the course of the day's deliberations there will be a lot of talk about the extent to which we are in fact ignoring it. If not actually abetting its emergence by failing to act against it. Let me conclude with just a specific point on, on Israel. Because I know that's importantly a very part, a very key part of this uh, this day's deliberations. I believe that the state of Israel is in the front lines of what I think is best described as the war for the free world. I use that term in preference over lots of others that have been used over the years, uh, war on terrorism, war against violent extremism, and the like, because I think it best conveys what's at stake here. It also makes pretty clear Who's on which side? Israel is absolutely, unmistakably, unalterably on our side. And one of my great fears is that we are signaling, perhaps unintentionally, perhaps subliminally, but I think increasingly unmistakably, we are not sufficiently on Israel's side. And the effect of such a signal to Iranians, like Ahmadinejad and Khamenei, to the Muhammad bodies of the Muslim Brotherhood, to the Yusuf al Karadawi's spiritual leader, to all of the Sharia gang, to say nothing of the bin Ladens and their ilk, is unmistakable, and this goes to the point of my column uh, in yesterday's Washington Times, uh, Tuesdays I guess now, um, and that is, there are dynamics at work in the world at the moment, not just the ones that I've cataloged for you, but others indeed, that are, I'm afraid, emboldening people to believe that a long-standing ambition to destroy the Jewish state may be realizable. And the indications from the United States that it would in any way respond to such actions other than with a swift, assured, and as needed, violent defense of Israel will, I'm afraid, not simply imperil our friends in Israel, but greatly intensify the danger to the free world more general, including us. Because indeed, Israel is, in the eyes of our enemies, but a speed bump on the road to getting to us. It is endlessly described, particularly by the Iranian regime, as the little Satan, while well, we are the great Satan. Everyone who desires to impose Sharia and to take down those who stand in the way of its triumph caliphate and the like, understand that Israel is just part of the problem. And anyone who tells you that if only we were to cut them loose or allow them to be eliminated, as the people that I've just been describing very much aspire to, that they will leave us alone, is deluding themselves certainly trying to delude the rest of us. 
again, to our extreme peril. And just to put a final point on this, how extreme? Uh, you may have seen over the weekend Roger Noriega, a former senior Bush administration official with responsibility for Latin America, revealed something at first I'd heard of it, perhaps you did too. I believe it was August 10th of last year. Hugo Chavez convened a summit in the military intelligence headquarters in Caracas to which he invited leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and others sympathetic to the murderous purposes to which they are committed. This was the product of a decision by the Iranian ambassador to Syria and the Venezuelan ambassador to Syria that it would really be helpful to bring everybody together in our, well, some people call it backyard, I think of it as our front yard. It simply underscores the point that these folks, all of whom are obviously closely aligned with Iran, most of whom are working in the same direction Iran aspires to, are our enemies, not just Israel's, are our mortal threat, not just the rest of the free worlds, and must be regarded as such. Thank you very much. Enjoy talking with you.